Hey everybody, we're back here with another game in the rapid game kind of playthrough here, uh, trying to fix my rapid rating here on chess.com. This is Adult and Frame, and we're playing a game here against Joga Bonito 9, rated 1594. Uh, this started off as a Sicilian defense, and white goes for this move c4. So I'm going to continue with knight to c6. c4 does have a slight drawback of weakening the d4 square, and sometimes white will progress this... Um, <laughs> This kind of opening with uh, trying to, you know, d well, it depends on if they're going to go for d4 or not. They may go for d4, which it looks like white might be working towards, or sometimes they'll hold off and playing d4 and play a bit more of a closed Sicilian type of opening. Um, so after knight f3, I'm going to go ahead and do, let's go ahead and do g6 here. If white does play d4, we'll go ahead and trade, play bishop g7 and go for uh, what's known as like an accelerated dragon. And if white doesn't play d4 in this case, as we're seeing, uh, I'm going to go ahead and play bishop g7. And we end up with a bit more of a, um, a close Sicilian type position, like I said. So the upside of the close Sicilian is that, you know, white does have space advantage. And it's, it's very easy for white to kind of play their moves. Um, it's not a lot of back and forth in the center just yet. There's no pawn trades. It's a little bit more closed, of course, kind of the way the name goes. Um, but the drawback to this opening is that it does weaken the d4 square. Especially if white does the move c4. Um, sometimes you'll see Sicilian defenses with the pawn on uh, c3 or back on c2 or something like that. So white definitely has the drawback of this weak d4 square. And I'm going to go ahead and just kind of keep an eye on this. I don't really want to let white make the move d4 if I can help it. Um, so I'm going to play d6 here. And um, I'm going to go ahead actually and do the move... Um, I could do a setup here with bishop to g4, trade off the bishop for the knight, and keep the square d4 well protected. But I'm actually going to kind of hold off on making that trade just yet, even though it is uh, probably an okay trade to do. I'm going to go ahead and go knight f6 here to hit the pawn. This doesn't really allow d4 yet, because I can take the pawn. But my next idea is to play knight to d7. And um, I'm going to continue preventing the move d4. And I'm actually going to play something like knight f8, 96 and aim towards the d4 square. So that's kind of the setup I'm going for at the moment. White's looking to play maybe bishop e3 and then d4, but I'm going to play knight f8 to e6 and prevent the move d4 from happening. So if I can prevent the move d4 from happening, as well as uh, get a knight on that square, um, that's going to be a pretty good situation for us. So now that the knight's gone to d5, I could make the move e6 and kick the knight away. But then that would just take away the e6 square from my knight. So I'm actually going to continue with my plan. Probably put this knight on d4 pretty soon. Get castled. Um, the nice thing is white can't really develop the bishop just yet because it was stuck protecting the b2 pawn. Now a lot of times white here will work to play a move like uh, b4 maybe. In order to um, kind of open up some lines on the queen side here. So I do have the option of playing a5 here. Kind of just uh, shutting that idea down. At least for, at least for a moment. Uh, I do think I'm going to go for that idea. Just preventing a lot of white's pawn breaks. He can't play d4, can't play b4. Um, I'm going to try to continue preventing b4 as much as I can here. Does play b3, okay. I'm going to go ahead and let's, uh, let's get castled here. If the bishop goes to b2, I'll end up trading the bishops because that's white's good bishop. Um, and then I'll probably try to f work on trading off this bishop for knight. Um, so we're going to go ahead and make this exchange. I'm going to then put the knight on d4 next move. If this trade happens, that's fine with me. I can always play e6 and kick this uh, knight off of d5. Um, I also could work to play bishop g4 next move, and then play bishop takes f3, kick this knight, and I'll have this really strong knight on the d4 square. So this really just goes from the opening phase, white having that e4 and c4 set up. I really just am focusing on trying to... Um, prevent white from playing d4, and if he can't play d4, and I can put a knight on d4, that's going to be a really nice outpost. And especially because it's a closed position, there's not any pawn trades or pawn breaks or anything like that just yet, um, I'm going to try to keep it that way, and I'm going to also look to try to get rid of the knights that white has. Um, my ideal situation is going to be a knight on d4 versus a bishop on g2. That'll be a really strong knight versus a, uh, a bit of a passive, kind of cramped-in bishop here. So... I don't mind a, knight, a trade of knights, but I want to keep at least one knight on the board. Um, if this trade happens, that's fine. I'll probably work on maybe doing bishop e6 and getting rid of the other knight pretty soon after that. Um, 
If white doesn't take my knight right now, bishop g4 is going to be the idea. But bishop g4 is actually going to be really annoying for white because, um, oh, e, e5 is a bit odd. Um, well, this could change things a little bit. I do have the ability to just simply capture a pawn here. Or I could maybe trade the knights and then take the pawn for free. I could also still play bishop to g4 um, because this pin is difficult for white to deal with. I guess knight e3 would, uh, would go back and attack the bishop there. I might as well just take the pawn for free, though. Uh, the question is, do I take with my pawn, do I take with my knight, or do I trade knights and then take the pawn on e5? Um, I think just taking the knight followed by taking the pawn is going to be the simplest way to play. Because I don't really want to take and double my pawns, I don't think, if I can help it. But there are also other benefits to using the pawn to take, because even though it does end up with doubled pawns, I do open up this uh, D file, and the D file is aiming right towards the uh, the D3 pawn, which is a bit of a weakness. So I might do something like um, probably I probably want to trade a pair of pieces regardless of which way I take, just because the less pieces on the board, the better it is when you're ahead in material. Um, Uh, da, 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 da. Still also thinking about bishop g4 a little bit, but I, I will just I think we'll just play it safe and simple. Just take the ball or take the knight first, and then mm, depends on how I want to take the knight after that, I suppose. So the bishop takes back, knight takes is still fine. Doesn't double my pawns or anything like that, or give me any weaknesses. Taking with the pawn though, followed by playing maybe e6, kicking this bishop out. Um, that could also be a uh, a perfectly fine way of playing as well. Even bishop h3 first, move the rook, and then take the pawn would be okay. Uh, taking with the knight and not doubling the pawns is also fine. I really do think both options are good. Um... I think I'm going to... I kind of want to take with the pawn because it's going to be a bit more interesting and kind of uh, give a little bit more, I guess, of an uh, interesting option here. So I'm actually going to take with the pawn even though it doubles the pawns. The idea, though, is to play something like bishop f5, e6, move the queen, put a rook on d8, um, and go after the d3 pawn. Um, if I, so all I have to do is kick the knight and then just uh, work towards attacking that pawn there. So I'm up a pawn, which is already good. I have a knight that's going to end up on d4 at, at some point. I don't necessarily need to rush in there anymore if my goal, uh, target is the d3 pawn. The knight on d4 would actually kind of block my queen out. Um, so I'm actually giving myself doubled pawns, but it is an extra pawn, first of all. So that's already you know, already good. And we're going to work towards attacking this, uh, this remaining pawn. So queen to c1 is a little bit odd. Um, the problem with queen to c1 is I can already play the move e6. Once the knight moves, then I'll just play queen takes uh, queen takes on d3 there. So I can actually just win a pawn right away, it looks like. So e6, knight goes to maybe c3. I take there, attacking the bishop. Bishop moves away somewhere. Um, and then I'm just going to be up a, uh, up a pawn at that point. Knight to d4 at some point also will attack the bishop pretty soon too. Bishop f5 would attack the pawn, but I think e6 is going to be uh, good enough here. So let's go e6. I also have the option if when white moves the knight away, I don't even actually have to take with my um, with my queen. I could maybe play uh, knight to b4 and then take with the knight on d3 instead. That's also another uh, interesting option. Okay, knight does go back. One of the Things I do have to be a little careful about is if I take the pawn, there is bishop takes knight, pawn takes back, and then I'm up two pawns, but my pawns are all, you know, isolated and doubled, which is not really ideal. Plus, my bishop on c8 especially is not very happy in that kind of situation. So, evaluating that a little bit more, I like, um, I'm actually not wanting to take the pawn just yet, because even though I'm ahead material, I'm going to have this dead bishop essentially, which is not exactly something I want to, um, want to happen. Plus, also, queen takes, bishop takes, pawn takes. 
uh, rook to d1, queen f5, rook to d2. Yeah, that, that would not really be an ideal uh, situation for me, I don't think. So, um, if I go knight to b4, there is rook to d2, and then if I take it, they attack my pink knight, and I don't really win material. So, I think I am, you know, kind of going back and forth between plans a little bit here. I think I am going to go for knight to d4, though, at the end of the day. I don't really want to let the bishop take my knight and end up with a bad bishop in that situation. Uh, I am already up a pawn, so I don't really need to do anything, you know, too fancy. What I'm going to try to do now is trade off my uh, bishop that's not really doing a whole lot. Now, it's kind of interesting, now that white played that move e5 earlier, now this bishop on g2 is not really a bad piece too much anymore. Um, it is still technically on the same color as the central pawns, but there is a bit more um, purpose or reason for me to trade off my bishop for his bishop, because mine's not very useful, whereas his has a wide open diagonal, which is very annoying. Um, so I kind of want to play b6, bishop b7 at some point, or bishop d7 to c6. I can't move the bishop right now, though, because white will just take the pawn. So I think I'm going to do... Um, this might look a little weird, but I'm kind of leaning towards the move like rook a7, because I want to play b6 and bishop b7, but I also might want to play rook d7 and aim towards that d3 pawn. Uh, rook a6 to d6 would be a similar idea, but that wouldn't really help with my bishop to b7, I, uh, b7 plan. So... This might look a little a little weird, but I'm going to go here. b6, bishop b7, or rook d7, um, stuff like that. White also has to kind of keep an eye on the e2 square. If this rook and knight disappear for whatever reason, I'll have to move knight e2 check. So the knight's already moved, so that's uh, you know now the rook is stuck protecting e2. Let's go ahead and play b6. They are attacking the pawn here, so I don't want to lose that. b6. There's no knight f6 check or anything like that. And the other nice thing is actually about the rook here, I can always play the move f5, and this will actually help to protect the king side. So if white plays queen h6 and tries to go for knight g5, I can move the f pawn, and uh, the h7 pawn will be protected. So my knight's great, I'm up a pawn. I'm going to try to play maybe rook d7, bishop b7, and kick the knight away, trade the pieces, and that's looking pretty good. So white plays bishop h3, I don't really see the purpose behind this move. I do again have this option of knight check and queen takes d3, just picking up a pawn. Um, I have to be a little careful though again because, you know, the queen could get trapped in some cases. Knight check, uh, king g2, queen takes here, knight f6 check, king moves, rook d2, I think ends up trapping the queen actually. So I do want to check and maybe play bishop b7, that would aim towards the king. So what I'm going to do first is, I'm going to play f5 first of all. I think I'm going to play f5 first. Bishop b7 first would be fine too. But I think I'm going to go for the forcing option f5. If the knight goes to g5, I actually have queen takes g5 followed by knight f3 check, winning the knight on g5. So that's pretty good. So the knight should probably go back in this direction somewhere. Knight d2 though doesn't work because of knight... Um, Knight e2 check if the knight goes to the d2 uh, d2 square. So really, knight to c3 is the only move. And then I can play knight f3 check. Uh, oops, let's not pre-move that. Knight f3 check, bishop g, uh, b7, something like that looks pretty strong. Or even bishop b7 right away, th threatening knight f3 uh, check ideas. Because then there will be some discovered checks on the, on the king. <laughs> Stuff like that's going to put um, the white in a bit of a tough spot there. Okay, so white goes to e2. As we said earlier, this is just a mistake, blocking off the check on e2. Um, now the rook's not protecting it. Notice how we were kind of focused on this square earlier, and as soon as white blocks off that square and it's not protecting it anymore, now we're able to um, get the knight there. So it wasn't just a, um, you know, they, I had to find the strong move. It was more so I was already looking in that direction before we even got to this position here. So, okay, so we won the game here. Let's go ahead and analyze this game, kind of see what was going on in this one. So e4, c5, c4, so we have a Sicilian defense. White does make this early c4 move. Um, so we go knight c6, knight f3, and I went for g6, which is um, kind of the accelerated dragon set, uh, set up here. If white had played d4, pawn takes, knight takes, I would have gone bishop g7. They probably played bishop e3, and this is a perfectly fine um, 
kind of Sicilian defense, uh, type of Sicilian defense. Knight f6, knight c3. You can go d6, uh, you can go knight g4. Technically that works because if they take your knight, you take on d4. Um, different ideas like that uh, work out in this position. So anyways though, um, when white does not play d4 though, when they've already played e4 and c4, they do weaken this d4 square here. And when they don't play d4, my entire setup here was uh, kind of geared for controlling the d4 square. Um, so I'm controlling it, and um, the idea here is that because white can't use a pawn to control the d4 square, it is an outpost for one of my pieces, especially a knight, as we kind of saw in the game, is going to be very strong on this square. Um, so bishop g2, d6, um, castle, knight f6. I'm only playing knight f6 because I know that white can't play d4 yet, because I can just... Uh, I could just take the pawn on e4, for example, or I could um, maybe even bishop g4, you know, this is going to put white under a little bit of pressure. This would be kind of similar to the game, except the difference would be the pawns on d5 instead of d3, and white is still pinned, which is a, a bit of a uh, awkward spot for white. So um, anyways, though, white played knight c3, and I went knight to d7. It looks a bit weird to move the knight around a bunch of times like this. But the position is closed. There's been no pawn trades. I'm kind of trying to prevent that from happening in the first place. And if white, if I can prevent white from playing d4, white might still have extra space. Technically speaking, white does have the, uh, the space advantage here still. But I'm going to have um, some something for it. I'm going to have this really strong square for my, uh, for my knight. Now, in comparison to, as we saw in the game, it looks like white's doing a good job controlling the d5 square. The problem with d5, though, is that I can always play the move e6 and kick a piece off if I need to. And that did happen in the game later on. Um, whereas if I have a piece on d4, there's no e3 or c3 pawn to come up and attack the knight. Or the bishop or whatever might be there. So uh, I do want to prevent this move from white, though. If I just went ahead and castled, um, white could potentially play the move d4. And then after pawn takes, knight takes... Um, there would be, you know, you could do some calculation with knight takes e4 with discovered attacks. Knight takes c6, knight takes c3. You know, that kind of gets a little bit messy for sure. Um, but at the at the very least, white would have the option of playing d4. Um, so I played knight d7 to prevent that, d3. And I could have castle here as well, that would have been fine. Um, but when white plays bishop e3, I again probably don't want to let white play the move d4 and get that in safely. So I could make a move in this kind of situation, like knight to d4. Um, I, I kind of like the way I, I did it in the game a little bit more, though, because I still, in order to have this knight aim towards d4, I'm going to have to move the rook, play knight f8, knight e6 anyways, or knight b8 to c6 would also be okay. Um, but a little bit of the difference here is that white does have the ability to maybe uh, take the knight, I take back with the pawn, the knight moves away maybe. Um, and white does uh, give me doubled pawns. He also, uh, I do get the bishop pair, but it's not really an open position just yet. So the bishop pair is maybe not a huge advantage or anything like that. So I think black would still be doing pretty well here. Um, white could maybe go play on the queen side, but, you know, there are some trade-offs here. I have a bad bishop on g7, doubled pawns, stuff like that. So um, the way I decided to play, though, is knight f8 right away. Knight d5, and as we saw, um, we could play e6, and I think a lot of people would play a move like that and not really think about the repercussion. The problem with e6 is that once the knight goes back, the question is, okay, what do we do with the knight on f8? You have to kind of think ahead of move some uh, a lot of times, or ahead of multiple moves a lot of the times, because if we just simply made the first forcing move we see, the knight moves away, and the question is, okay, what's, what's the knight doing on f8? I don't really want to go back to d7. That's not where I, you know, that's where I was just a moment ago, but I can't go to e6 anymore. And if I play a move like e5, trying to go to e6, now I've given white his own d5 square. I don't have the move e6 anymore. So really important for the sequence of moves here, I want to put the knight into d4 first, then kick the knight off of, um, off of d5. So knight e6, rook b1. I stop his b4 idea. If I had just played knight d4 right away, he might have been able to do something like knight takes, knight takes, and, uh, and b4. And he'd be able to open up the queen side, and um, you'll be able to get some counterplay. So a lot of times also when you're looking to um, push your own plan forward, you also want to keep in the back of your mind what your opponent's doing at the same time. Because if they have a certain plan they're working towards, you don't really want to let them, um, You don't, especially if it's a good plan, you don't really want to let them do it for free. 
So a5 stops that. This does weaken the b5 square, but that's, you know, even if the knight gets there, it's not doing a whole lot productive. It's kind of off of the center of the board. So I'm okay with giving that um, that square up a little bit. So white played b3. I did castle. Bishop b2. We went ahead and made this trade of pieces and then put the knight on d4. And if white hadn't played um, e5 in the game, which I think was a uh, is just a mistake losing material. If white had played something like, I don't know, maybe rook to, rook to e1 or something. Um, I was prepared to play bishop g4 for the pin. And then I might play bishop takes knight. Um, I might also go knight e5, actually. Knight e5 attacking the, uh, the pin knight here more would be a problem. White might go knight e3 attacking my bishop. But then it's very important here for us to do bishop takes knight. We don't want to trade the knight for the, uh, for the knight. Because what ends up happening here is we do still have the strong d4 square. But this knight can challenge our knight. After the queen moves, he might play knight c2 looking to kick away our strong knight. Whereas if I play bishop takes knight, bishop takes back. If he tries to go, you know, knight c2 at some point, uh, you know, later on, I can always trade the knights and put the other knight back on d4. Or wait for him to take me and I'll take back on d4. Um, keep in mind, my goal was to have a good knight on d4 versus the kind of blocked in bishop on um, f3. So maybe from this position we could play like a4, uh, a4, try to open up a file for a rook pretty soon. Um, something like this. Uh, I think, tactically speaking, this action works out, because if the queen takes there, we have a uh, knight takes f3, forking the king and the rook. So something like that would be uh, pretty useful for us. Yeah. Take, take, knight into d4 again, maybe something like that. Or, you know, we don't even have to play for it necessarily, but something like that would be a, a plan here for sure. Um, in the game, though, white played e5, which is just a, a bit odd for sure. Um, so I could have done bishop g4, I could have done knight takes e5, I could have done, you know, pawn takes e5. I ended up doing knight takes uh, f3 and then pawn takes on e5. Um, I do actually like this capture a bit more than knight takes, because if I do knight takes um, and the bishop moves away, now white might be able to play for d4. And when I go back to c6 to stop d4, maybe rook e1, you know, maybe white can use the, um, the e file a little bit. Maybe something like that. And I don't have as much, uh, I don't have as good of a way to attack the d3 pawn because the d file is blocked up. So even though this does give me doubled pawns, it gives me a pretty clear plan. I have the strong d4 square, but I also have the idea of e6 at some point and trying to go after d3 once the knight's out of the way. So queen to c1, uh, we did play e6, knight moved away. Um, I think if I had taken the pawn, I, I was worried about bishop takes c6 here. Pawn takes back. And again, like I said, even though white's down um, two pawns, they are, you know, two sets of doubled pawns, an isolated pawn, and my bishop is uh, pretty much dead. It's going to be very hard to get this bishop in the game. So even though white is down two pawns, I would actually take white over black in this position. Um, mainly because of the... Um, white is down two pawns or two points in the absolute value. But it's also very important uh, to think about the relative value, which essentially means not looking just at the points, but also looking at the value of what's on the board. If you think of it here, I'm up two pawns, but I'm down a bishop. So technically, you know, if you want to think of it that way, I'm down a point, actually. Because even though I have a bishop, I can't use it. So if I can't use a piece, I don't really, you know, I can't, it's hard to count it as a useful piece. So very important that we don't necessarily just rush for grabbing the first thing we see. It looks good to take it. Um, however, I do think this would actually be a big positional mistake because this kind of situation, oops, this kind of situation here, uh, white could now play rook to d2 and then maybe rook to d1 like I mentioned earlier. And the question is like, what, what do I do? It's very hard to come up with a good idea here. If I push this, the knight takes it. Uh, if I play this, you know, White might just go attack it. Kind of hard to keep it protected. Um, white might play rook to d8 at some point, taking full control of the file. Could play knight a4, attacking this pawn. Could play maybe like king g2, f3, knight e4 at some point. I just, even though black's up two pawns, it really doesn't feel like we're up two pawns in this position. So very important to not rush and just capture that pawn. Knight to d4 I think is much better. We're already up one pawn. We don't need to get greedy for a second one at the cost of almost being down a bishop at that point. So knight d4, rook a7. Um, 
I actually like this move quite a lot. It looks very weird, um, but I'd be willing to bet that it's probably a pretty good move in the position. I don't necessarily know. Um, I could, you know, turn on the computer for a quick moment. Um, it does, Stockfish on chess.com actually does like rook a7 as being a strong move here. So that's kind of nice to, nice to confirm. Um, it looks like a really weird move, but it has a very clear plan with b6, rook d7, uh, bishop b7. It's helping me to accomplish everything I want in the position, essentially. Uh, I want to trade these bishops because white's bishop is more useful than mine at the moment, especially because this pawn's in the way on e6. I want to get a, more pieces towards the d-file so that I can attack d3. And I, in order to do that, you know, I can't play b6 here. I can't move the bishop right away. So let's kind of reposition everything um, and build this attack towards the d3 pawn. So that's what I did. I played b6 to guard the pawn on c5. And then f5 here attacking the knight. Pretty much white has to go back to c3. I think this is the only move that works. Uh, but then I would still play something like knight f3 check, king moves, maybe rook to d7, bishop b7. This is still... This is still a very bad position for white, for sure. Something like this would be uh, just very, very strong. Um, this die feels amazing. Uh, the rook is going to win the d3 pawn pretty soon. Black is definitely uh, much better here. Um, once the knight goes to d2, though, notice how even earlier on, as soon as we played the move knight d4 and the bishop went back, we were already kind of eyeing this e2 square. We were saying, okay, if the knight and the rook moved, you can back up the video if you, you, know, you want to confirm that. If the knight or the rook moved, there might be a knight e2 check. So as the game went along, I saw the knight moved away, and I said, okay, if the rook moves, I'll have knight e2 check. Or if the rook can't guard e2, I'll have this check. And then as soon as the knight blocks the rook, I didn't really have to do a lot of, you know, I didn't have to say, okay, what's the best forcing moves or anything like that. I already was kind of eyeing this idea. And as soon as it becomes a reality or, you know, a possibility now, now we just check right away, we win the game, and we win the game. So I think this is a really good game example for how to play a closed position, especially when you have uh, an outpost available, how to kind of uh, have your plan revolve around that outpost, how to go after weak pawns, um, being it, being kind of willing to break certain principles, you know, don't give yourself double pawns, but um, I gave myself double pawns in the game with the idea of using the open uh, half open D file at that point. So um, definitely an interesting uh, kind of idea there uh, that looks like it works out pretty well. Um, and then the really strong knight on d4, how to use that, how to plan well in these positions. So I really I think this was a, uh, a good game that kind of covers those, uh, those strategic aspects. So anyways, though, that's it for this game. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed it. I will see you guys around in the next video, and I will talk with you guys again then. All right. Bye, everybody.